continuing uh, acceleration of digital technology uh, keeps taking us past uh, new thresholds of possibility of uh, creating data sets that let us observe ourselves in new ways, how we communicate, how we socially interact, um, and advance our ability to understand and uh, ultimately to shape the human condition. Uh, Ten years ago, uh, we crossed one of those thresholds. I was interested in language acquisition and how children uh, crack the code of language, and we had just sort of entered a point where it was possible for uh, you know, a small, a modest lab uh, at MIT to instrument a home. This is uh, peering through cameras in our house. And capture more or less comprehensively um, the first couple of years of my son's development in the natural environment of our home. And we developed not just the ability to capture a large data set, but uh, ways to analyze and visualize patterns in that data and start making sense of the interaction of language uh, and context. So I'll show you one uh, brief example of sort of a body of work that um, came out over several years. Um, in this video, you'll see in a moment my son start to move around the coffee table. Uh, this is viewing from overhead. And our nanny offers him some water, and we tag that moment. And you'll see a little ribbon go up with a transcript of him hearing water. This is before he's ever uh, said the word water. And our interest was in understanding the social context in which he's exposed to the word water that eventually lead to him uh, learning to say that word. You want water? Uh, no. All right. He's offered water. And if you watch those two little trails, we're tracking his motion and his caregiver's motion. And as we now take a view over the whole uh, landscape of our house, and we look through time, and we trace back, and we find every time in his life that he heard the word water, and we accelerate through time, and look at the sort of footprint of all of the social interaction that surrounded two years of hearing the word water, what's left in its wake is this kind of landscape, we call it a wordscape, of the context in which he heard the word water. And this became a input in a model that let us predict why he learned words in the order he did, the hundreds of words that emerged in his vocabulary. It's an example of using a massive data set and developing analytics to sort through and find patterns from, from natural behavior. So that work led um, in uh, about five years after that with one of my graduate students, Michael Fleischman, uh, we again realized we're crossing uh, yet another threshold uh, leading to Bluefin Labs. This was a company that uh, we took out of the Media Lab, and what we realized was it was possible now to move up to a new, a new scale and map now not just the conversa conversation one home, but the conversation of all public social media in the United States, and to look at the relationship to what was on television. So we, we built machinery that could actually map all of the content of US television in real time. So you're, you're seeing here a picture of uh, a slice of actual data. In the bottom, the content graph of US uh, television programming and advertising on the top public social media on Facebook and, and Twitter. And we started to map uh, actual links between broadcast television and the conversation that was being stimulated uh, in, uh, in US audiences uh, that were spilling over basically from real couches onto the virtual couch of online chatter. And as we built a real-time engine that mapped uh, all conversations uh, in the US 24-7, what this, this data opened up was a completely new window into television audiences. So in the U United States, a $70 billion industry, and very quickly uh, we were able to start finding a market for these analytics. Television broadcasters and advertisers in the US started uh, making decisions based on, on our data. And um, as, as this company uh, got scale, uh, Twitter approached us. This was in uh, early 2013. Um, acquired Bluefin. Uh, our technology has been deployed now uh, on, uh, globally uh, as part of the Twitter platform, enabling uh, new advertising capabilities uh, and soon uh, new consumer experiences based on uh, this kind of uh, merger of uh, looking at the, the Twitter conversation as it uh, sort of becomes more and more entangled with what's on TV. So last couple of years I've, I've spent uh, transitioning this capability into Twitter uh, and working uh, with Twitter on uh, various issues of strategy around media 
and the global growth uh, strategy of the company. And, um, and meanwhile, I, I transitioned back to my faculty position at the Media Lab. And just a, a couple of weeks ago, we made an announcement that uh, is really a, a partnership between Twitter and MIT and the MIT Media Lab to create a new laboratory. It's called a Laboratory for Social Machines, which I lead. And so I, I want to just take the, uh, a few minutes and give you a sense of where this lab is heading. It's, it's a brand new lab. We have about 15 people now uh, that just a few weeks ago uh, started to, to come together at MIT. And the idea is to take lessons learned both from our research in sort of uh, studying um, natural communications or in context, applying some of the lessons learned in industry scale solutions from Bluefin and, and, and Twitter, and, and bring them to bear on areas where we think we can have real social impact. So um, the first project that we actually started working on a, a, a few months back uh, is to look at what happened last year during the Boston Marathon bombings uh, in Boston, right in our own backyard. So this is a geotag, the first tweet, a minute after the first bomb blast in Boston uh, uh, on Twitter. And uh, as part of uh, Twitter's arrangement with uh, MIT, we have complete access to all tweets uh, over the history of the company available to our lab. And so we're now mapping the conversations, uh, not only on Twitter, but then on Reddit and through the news cycle, as the world uh, sort of lit up in news, but also a lot of rumors started to spread about what was happening uh, in Boston. And so we're developing uh, capabilities to actually trace back through all of the data archives we now have access to, to understand what the anatomy of a, room, a rumor looks like, and to, to build what we think is possible in early warnings, early, early uh, detectors of when a piece of information that's actually false is starting to get velocity. Um, and an early uh, warning system like that, we think, could have great value for journalists and for authorities dealing with emergency situations. Um, what, what um, kind of looking at the data around the Boston Marathon bombings and various other kind of emergent situations, um, there's a pattern that you start to see, I'm sure you're all sort of aware of this, that with uh, digital networks and global social media capabilities such as Twitter and others, um, there's a tendency towards more ad hoc and disruptive kinds of social activity. Protests are easier, it's easier to disrupt, harder to get uh, systemic uh, and constructive social change, which is the direction that we want to actually uh, head with our laboratory. So I want to um, take you now to a, a place you've probably never heard of in the south of Spain, in the province of Granada, that is, uh, we think in some ways, a pointer to the future of how to harness this kind of new bursty social energy and create uh, what we think is a, a, a very important idea of uh, responsive systems, social feedback loops that harness uh, this kind of uh, digital network activity uh, for more constructive change. So this is, um, these are tweets coming from this little town in Spain called Hun, population 3,500. So the first thing that's unusual is when you just look at the map, there's a lot of conversation in public from this town. When you visit the town, you start to see some unusual things. So the, the police in this little town, if you look carefully on the sleeve of this police officer, has embroidered a Twitter handle. In fact, the police and everyone else who works officially for the town of Hoon uh, is on Twitter and are publicly showing how you can talk to them. So as opposed to the New York PD where see something, say something through a private uh, secure uh, link to the police, instead in Hoon, the, the motto is see something, tweet something, and the difference is pretty dramatic because when you tweet something, Everybody, not just the police, can see what you're saying. So this is true uh, with the police. I want to show you an example of what this leads to on a daily basis in Hoon. This is a tweet that we've translated into English. A resident of Hoon tweets that there's a street light uh, that's broken. And nine minutes later, Jose Antonio, the mayor of this town, tweets back and says, thanks for letting us know. And he makes a promise publicly the electrician's on it, he'll be on it tomorrow. Early the next morning, the electrician tweets, says, thanks for letting us know about the lamp. Photograph with a ladder showing uh, that the lamp has just been repaired. And if you notice very carefully at the bottom of this tweet, two retweets and a favorite. This is a town of 3,500. This is the electrician who's, who's closing this loop. So this is a, an example of not just one person 
taking responsibility and letting the town know something's broken, but actually there's a system here. The resident makes note, someone with the, the authority to dispatch and the authority to promise on behalf of someone else does so. And the electrician, if you think about what are the pressures and, and sort of the, uh, the environment that this person is in, uh, operating in, it's a combination of kind of carrot and stick. The stick is that this electrician is uh, operating in a, um, in a mutual visibility environment. Everyone can see each other and everyone's aware of that, a kind of uh, epistemological hall of mirrors because we are operating in, in this digital public sphere. And so there's uh, accountability and public pressure to, to respond. But there's also the carrot. Normally a thankless job of fixing a lamp suddenly is being retweeted and favored and, and this person is sort of uh, recognized. Um, so uh, this, is, this works because there is a visionary mayor, unusual number of followers, 260,000 followers for someone who's a mayor of 3,500 uh, 3, people. Uh, we're uh, starting work with Jose Antonio and his town. He's offered to open up the entire archives of their town so we can actually trace back over time and look at how various uh, responsive feedback loops have been implemented in this town. And what we want to do is not just understand this little town, but actually take some of the principles and build scalable tools to apply some of these ideas in different contexts. So this brings us to uh, really uh, just a, a proposal, a kind of uh, a fiction that I want to take you through for how we imagine some of these ideas might translate into other environments. I have, my family comes from India, I spent a lot of time in India growing up, so I have an interest in uh, sort of matching some of these ideas into uh, places where we think we could have, have impact here. Um, so here is a, a completely made up scenario, which I think in short order could become reality. Uh, and it's not just a technology, but it's a human technology, a social machine solution that we imagine. So imagine you're in Delhi, and there, the, the scenario that we want to uh, kind of picture for a moment is that there is a, um, an auto rickshaw driver, and he's been observing for the last couple of hours uh, four men on the street corner harassing women um, as they walk by. And this auto rickshaw driver uh, speaks, and the speech recognizer translates his report into a tweet. That tweet reporting uh, this, uh, what's going on in the street corner, of course, immediately goes to the police officer who is uh, closest by. We have geo uh, location. This is uh, possible today. Um, but since it's a tweet, that same information spreads to the local uh, environment, and a number of people actually respond, some who are actually close by and ob observe the same problem, uh, retweet, and effectively verify uh, independently this observation. Now this police officer is using a, a 2,000 rupee smartphone, but on it is an app that's powered by real-time analytics that is actually creating a prioritized ticketing uh, uh, system. That is saying there's enough independent verification, there's a persistent problem here, and this police officer decides to act, uh, dispatches an officer uh, to go and, and break up the situation. Meanwhile, a data journalist has a corresponding, a coupled app that can see the same information, mutual visibility, as this police officer. And when they see that um, the situation's been uh, dealt with, uh, this, this journalist writes a little story, um, actually, uh, in this scenario, um, awarding a, a kind of local hero of the day to the person who originally made the observation. What I want to point out is the individual technologies, you know, many of you are probably aware of crowdsourced safety apps that exist today. Um, and there are various technologies that are being adopted or sort of uh, explored for, for uh, police and, uh, and ditto for data journalism, a very uh, active space. But what is, uh, I think, missing to some degree and where we want to uh, make a contribution is to think about, at a systems level, the, the coupled interactions that are required for this scenario. Uh, first of all, people adopting a certain behavior and believing if they actually make a report, it can make a difference. The ability to not become overwhelmed by too many requests and take the limited resources that a, a police uh, department would have and use them optimally, and to monitor at scale and to report in a way where a journalist can actually have uh, measurable impact. It, it's all uh, due to having this kind of coupled approach. And um, the, the kind of analytics required to make something like this work and to optimize it uh, in place 
uh, is actually possible today. The same uh, way of thinking of how schools and children are beginning to shift their relationship because of smart apps uh, that have content, I think often miss a very important third leg of the tripod, which are mentors who may not have formal uh, ability to train, but again, the same idea of connected systems. So we're looking at these two areas, public safety uh, and, and learning, in particular literacy learning, as places where this kind of uh, combination of decentralized networks um, that are deployed in a, in a sort of scalable fashion are, are possible in terms of the economics and the technology. And so that, that's the, really the, uh, the kind of thinking that is starting to brew at the new um, uh, MIT Laboratory for Social Machines, this idea of uh, system solutions. And um, uh, we would love to find partners who uh, would like to work with us and start uh, experimenting uh, in this area. Thank you.